Well, a short time ago, I spoke to Dr Andrew Davies, the Director of the Operations and Capability Program at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Dr Davies was in our Parliament House studio. Dr Andrew Davies, welcome to Late Line. Thank you, Ali. How did we get to the position where we have no serviceable landing ships and we need a team of independent experts to fix the problem? Well, look, there's no easy answer to that. It's been an ongoing saga, um, and it's not the first time we've been there. We were actually there in the late 1990s as well. So the question is actually, how did we get there again? And is it fair to ask whether the Defence Department is incompetent? Um, well, look, they're doing a tough job, but I think it's certainly fair to ask the question because when it's all said and done, this is a pretty central military um, capability that... Uh, isn't necessarily there when the government wants it. So, yeah, it's a fair question to ask. Indeed. It took the Seaworthiness Board to discover the problems and, quote, they were a significant level of aggregated risk as a result of shortcomings in areas including manning levels, training loads, experience, maintenance, integrated logistics support and configuration management. That sounds like an awful lot of issues to have overlooked. Oh, look, absolutely. And um, wh one of the things that's talked about in... Uh, uh, that the Minister talked about today and has talked about in the documentation that he's released is, is a culture of regarding these ships as somehow second-rate. And, and does that marry with what you know? Well... They're certainly not sexy. I mean, they're not the frigates, they're not the submarines of the fleet, but they really are the backbone of the ability to move the ADF from one place to another. So in no sense are they really second-rate, but it's possible that they were regarded that way. Well, I mean, you say the backbone. How can the Navy operate without them? How big a difference do they make to their operational capability? Well, there's the distinction between the Navy and the ADF more broadly. If the ADF wants to go somewhere, if we wanted to, to deploy a bunch of troops and their vehicles and all their support equipment, these are the ships that would take them there. And when, in 1999, things blew up in East Timor, it was precisely these sorts of vessels that took the 6,000 troops from Australia to Timor with all of their vehicles, all of their support equipment, basically made it possible to do that mission. So why then this, uh, I suppose, this uh, attitude of them being second rate, where does that come from? Well, they're not the sexy... Um, high-end war fighting sort of things. If you like an aerial equivalent, they're the sort of Hercules um, transport aircraft compared to the F-18 fast jets. So what do you think has gone wrong? The, the Navy blames in part outsourcing and a loss of skills and what it calls, quote, constant change in much of defence. What does that mean? Well, there's two quite different things there. The, uh, the, the Navy is right that they don't have the skills within the service that they used to have in terms of naval engineering. Um, there was a time when uh, we had our own government shipyard up at Cockatoo Island in New South Wales and the Navy had all of the engineering skills uh, required to support a dockyard. Now, that's long gone and those skills have slowly atrophied from the service. Now, it begs the question that if they didn't have those skills in-house, why didn't they go and contract them from the private sector? And, and part of the Navy's explanation, part of Defence's explanation, is the outsourcing that's occurred and the running down of skills inside the service. And the uh, constant but... change in much of Defence? Yes, well, the Defence periodically goes through um, a series of reviews and recommendations and changes. If something's in service for 20, 30 years, it can have gone through four or five of these lots of changes, and it always takes time for them to bed down. And so to a certain extent, it's true that it can be hard to track um, consistently over the lifetime of something like a ship. Um, all of the changes that have happened and have that corporate knowledge. So, in essence, is there a chronic skill shortage in the Navy? Um, I think it's more accurate to say that Navy has, uh, doesn't have the, the range of skills that it had 20, 30 years ago, but that's no excuse for allowing a major national capability to run downhill. There are plenty of commercial shipping operators who don't have those engineering skills within their company, but they still manage to maintain and run their ships. So is it a budget issue? Um, no, it's hard to blame it on the budget either. In fact, the portfolio budget statements that came out last week showed that defence has underspent by at least half a billion dollars in the last year and the sustainment budget has underspent by $240 million. So lack of money doesn't seem to be the problem. Well, it seems that the government's effectively called time 
on the Navy's handling of the ships, doesn't it, with the putting in place of the independent panel of experts to work out how to address the problem. Is that, in effect, a shot across the bow of defence? Well, what it is, I think, is a very clear message that the government's not prepared to uh, listen to excuses and to be told that the ships aren't available. That it's simply not good enough for them, and nor should it be. I, I guess, uh, though, how will today's speech by the Minister be taken by Defence and also the Minister's decision to publicly release the Navy's own assessment? Well, I, I'm sure there'll be some people who aren't too thrilled about that, but when it's all said and done in the Westminster system, the Minister's the one responsible. So it's not about people's feelings, it's about um, accountability to the Minister. It does seem that many a minister has had frustrations with defence. Why is that? A, a variety of reasons. Some reasonable, some not so reasonable. D defence is often seen as a bit of a fiefdom sitting up there on Russell Hill. Um, and it's not entirely clear that it's always seen the need to explain itself to the minister. Um, that, that's the bad reasons. Uh, a more reasonable reason is that it's a very, very complex business. Um, it's not like a, a BHP where you can have a whole bunch of different divisions doing different things and they're more or less independent. With the military, all of these things have to get, come together in a seamless whole. It's actually a really, really hard business to manage. So some sympathy there, um, but still no excuse for uh, what the point we've reached today. And do, do you have any faith that now that we've got to this point and there's public recognition of it, the problems will be fixed? Um, cautious optimism, I would say, rather than faith. Um, the, the airworthiness board that the Air Force instituted a few years ago certainly was a big step forward in terms of managing the air fleets. So a seaworthiness board along the same sort of model, um, yes, cautious optimism that um, things will improve. Dr Andrew Davies, many thanks for joining Lateline. Thank you, Ali.